Monster Island was a trilogy of SpongeBob SquarePants games made by Workin' Man for Nick.com. These were notable because all three of them were significantly different from one another. Now if you're like me, you might be thinking, Monster Island? Are we getting a SpongeBob crossover with Godzilla? Unfortunately, this isn't the case. But there is one interesting fact about this series. Many years after these games came out, an episode called Delivery to Monster Island aired as part of Season 13. How often is it that we see something from a Spongebob game actually work its way into the show? And here I'm still waiting for an episode to take place in Bottoms Up, or the creepy hotel from the AWE movie. Come on, Nickelodeon, give the people what they want. Oddly enough, Godzilla actually did appear in the episode, so we got something of a crossover after all. But let's take a look at this trilogy and witness the legacy it left behind. The first one is just called Monster Island. It's divided into separate episodes that were released daily for five days. This was typical for a lot of games on Nick.com. It really kept you waiting to see what happened next. We see icons of each monster that will be prominently featured in each level. Since we aren't in the year 2010 anymore, we can just do all of them in a row. In the first episode, we see SpongeBob and Patrick on a boating trip that goes horribly wrong. A big storm strands them on Monster Island, and it isn't long before Patrick is picked up by a flying monster. Then another one called Monster X appears in front of SpongeBob. Then we... oh sorry, we have to click go to continue moving. Didn't realize that. In this first round, you're controlling Spongebob with the mouse and trying to run away from Monster X while evading obstacles. Well, I guess it's better to be chased by Monster X than Mr. X. You can collect crystals for points, and you can even throw them at the monster. Hitting these eyeball-infested rocks can also slow you down and let it catch up to you. But the stage is really short and really easy. I won it even though I thought I lost. I appreciate a game that understands the nature of forgiveness. Then we get a cutscene where we meet, uh, Sandy. What's she doing here? Actually, it's Island Sandy. How do you think she came to exist? Squirrels aren't exactly common underwater. Did Plankton clone Sandy and throw all her clones out to sea or something? But she helps you by throwing you a magic staff that grants you control of the monsters. The next stage is similar to the first, but this time you're riding on Monster X's head. This one also has enemies. Aside from the all-seeing rocks, we have these rocky turtle guys on the ground and demonic jellyfish in the air. You can jump over obstacles and enemies, and even double jump for more complicated obstacle arrangements, but you have limited jump power that decreases if you run into something. Thankfully, if you collect these crystals, Monster X unleashes a sound wave that destroys every everything it hits. Eh, most of the time at least. This one's actually kind of difficult. It's longer than the first and there's more to keep track of on the screen. You can wind up surrounded and begging for a crystal to show up, but it's pretty good. Once you beat it, Monster X flings Spongebob into a chasm. There, he lands on a sea monster. <laughs> it's a sea monster in an underwater sea. Hey, I think it's time for a new theory. Remember how confused I was by the fact that Employee of the Month featured a restaurant that served fish, even though the characters are, you know, kind of fish themselves? What if there are separate fish that live in the oceans under the ocean, and those ones are considered fair game for consumption? Yeah, I know, I'm looking too deep into it, let's just move on. The next stage is mostly the same deal, except you can't jump. You control the serpent called Monster Y and avoid rocks and enemies in the water. You can still attack, but now you control when you attack rather than just doing it whenever you collect a crystal. They call it exploding power. You know, all this crystal collecting is really making me miss the old tack games. Anyone remember those? Anyone? The enemies here look a bit goofy, but don't let appearances deceive you. If you get cornered, they'll be your worst nightmare. This is just as challenging as the one before it, but it took me less time to complete, surprisingly enough. Sometimes you get hit with a bunch of obstacles at once and don't have much space on the screen to escape to. Not to mention the all-seeing rocks are capable of defying the limitations of physical reality. After this stage, a goofy-looking monster picks you up and drops you in front of a mountain. You then see Patrick being dropped into it, but luckily enough, you meet a monster that looks like Gary. I assume if snails are supposed to be undersea cats, this would be the equivalent of meeting a lion. You then ride Monster Z up the mountain while things are falling on you. You collect gems, but avoid the bouncing rocks with faces. You have an eye meter that slowly fills, and when it's full, you can charge through the turtles on the ground. Not even the armless geodudes can hurt you. This one's the most fun, though I also found it easier than the two before it. At the top of the mountain, you enter a cave. There, you meet the most frightening monster yet, but it isn't nearly as frightening as the giant rock that's coming to crush you. Heh, <laughs> intrusing. Now you ride the hairy crab jellyfish demon through the cave to get away from the giant rock coming at you. 
As one might expect, this is the hardest stage, but largely because it's hard to get the hang of. You have to punch through stalactites and stalagmites to clear a path, and if you hold the punch button, you can unleash a more powerful one. Though the punch looks rather pathetic for a giant hairy crab jellyfish demon. Holding the punch button down doesn't always work for me, and I can't figure out what determines if it does or not. You can use either the spacebar or the mouse, but neither seemed to work better than the other. I found it was more effective to just smash the heck out of whichever button I used. This only barely worked because I had to depend on luck to determine which obstacles were generated. If I got more obstacles I could go around, I had a better shot at winning because I didn't have to smash as many. Once you finish the cave segment, you find Patrick about to eat a turtle, which is kinda hilarious. Then you crash into him and the island flicks you away with the giant hand it mysteriously grows. Strange, but appropriately cartoonish. That concludes the first of this trilogy, and it's pretty good. The stages follow the same format, but they're different enough to have their own value. It's all complete with the usual Spongebob quirkiness. The difficulty is there, but never too excessive. If you like this style of screen scrolling, this could be worth checking out but both of its sequels were much more involved and absolutely nothing like the first one. So let's continue the story with a return to Monster Island. This time, we can save our progress in one of three slots, so we know this is going to be much bigger than the first. Apparently, Monster Island has become a tourist attraction, so I guess SpongeBob and Patrick spread the word after their first visit. Mr. Krabs, Patrick, Squidward, and Sandy are taking a cruise ship over there, but SpongeBob missed the boat, so he hitches a ride with a fisherman to reach the island, but now he has to catch up with the others. We're then put into a top-down format and the game begins. This bears a strong resemblance to an older SpongeBob game called Invasion of the Lava King, a game I so desperately want to review, but I can't seem to find a version of it that isn't bugged beyond playability. One of these days, Lava King, just you wait. We have a map of the island, five hearts for health, and a spatula we can attack with by either hitting spacebar or pressing a button on the screen. It's so much easier to use the spacebar. Right away, we can head into a museum and fight some silly looking monsters. When the screen clouds up, you have to clear all the monsters before moving into the next room. It's a fine format, but don't re-enter a room you've already cleared or you have to do it again. You can collect gems for points, but they aren't required for you to progress. As you go on, you find that the museum is in shambles. This is obviously concerning. Outside, you're attacked by a big purple monster, but carried off by a whole tribe of island sandies. Their leader is named Dusty, which is really clever, actually. And you wind up in the Squirrel Village. This is when you realize you are playing a full-blown RPG. They didn't hold anything back with this. Dusty tells you the monster you encountered is taking all the tourists, so she gives you the control wand from the first game to control monsters that can help you. You're then able to travel the village and talk to its inhabitants. No way. I know this squirrel did not just make a Skyrim reference. I can say with certainty that that is one thing I never expected to see in any form of Spongebob media. Though the command to use the staff is interesting. Even if you use the spacebar to attack, you still need to click on the screen to use the wand. I'm surprised it doesn't have a designated key. If it does, I haven't been able to find it. Once you leave the village, you make your way to a cave where you can fight more monsters. Oh hey, I think Black Doom lost his eye. The first monster you meet that you can control is this big orange thing. You hit it a bunch of times with your spatula, then when it's dazed, you hit it with a wand and you can ride it. This makes traveling and fighting enemies so much easier, especially with its electric moves. You can also use it to fight this one-eyed floaty thing, then you can also ride it. Once you're back outside, you have to fight your way through the island to ride even more monsters and find everyone else. The first one you encounter is this giant bubblegum monster. Ah, what next? I love the way it moves. So let's keep going and, uh... Oh. That isn't good. Yeah, I had a few issues with this part of the game. I found that if I crossed into another screen when I was too close to the surrounding trees, I'd get stuck on them and wouldn't be able to move. I'd have to restart and hope it spawned me somewhere else. Sometimes it didn't. The struggles of a save system, I know. This happened multiple times throughout this section, and it might be a result of the game being old and running weirdly with modern technology, but be careful of this if you try to play it today. The next monster you meet can jump over crevices, but you don't stick with it for very long because you eventually find this cool one that can travel through water and... Oh, that's... interesting. Can't say it isn't awesome, though. Check it out, I'm swimming on land. This gets a bit confusing because you actually have to return to the museum you started in. Then you reach the most metal cave in existence. This would make one heck of an album cover. Inside, we find... uh... Is this hell? Now we're in a volcanic zone with big rocks and lava surrounding us. The first big monster we meet is some guy in jeans. The most stylish one yet. 
The other is this four-headed guy that casually puts bombs down to blow stuff up. He looks like the demented cousin of Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast. You can use his bombs to blow up rocks that are blocking your path, but the mini enemies in this cave can be hard to fight even with him. These ones blow up before they die, so you better run as soon as you kill them. Eventually, you reach this sentient pile of muck and ride it across the lava to reach the end. Now you can face the biggest monster once and for all. You have to fight this devious purple thwomp three times in a row without the chance to find extra lives, but it isn't too hard. He switches his tactic every round, so if you know what you're doing, you can stay out of his reach and attack from the side. Once you know what to do, he's pretty easy. He may be the biggest, but he sure isn't the most interesting monster we've met. Once you slay him, you find your friends in the room behind him. Like in the village, you can talk to them and see what they have to say. Once you leave, all your monster friends come back to give you a ride home. That concludes Return to Monster Island. This was a lot of fun, and I like that they tried something more ambitious with this. It's short, but it does feel like a proper Spongebob Legend of Zelda experience. The glitches were a pain, but again, it could just be a curse of time. The very same one that prevents me from replaying my beloved childhood classic. How dare technology improve over time. But this was really good. Still can't get over that Skyrim reference, though. But there's one other Monster Island game that we need to check out. It's called Monster Island Adventures, and it's completely different from either of these. This time, SpongeBob, Squidward, Patrick, and Sandy are delivering Krabby Patties to someone on Monster Island. They speak through these dialogue boxes during cutscenes. Because they're going through a monster-infested island, they're at risk of having the Krabby Patties eaten by the monsters. That means they need to fight their way to the customer. Then we're thrown into an RPG style similar to a Pokemon battle. Monsters try to eat your patty, so you have to switch between the main four characters and use different abilities to fight them off. You have to pay attention to which monster is weak to what type of ability. The icon next to their name will tell you if they're annoyed by sound, smell, or sight. You then use a move in one of those categories to fend them off. After every fight, you head to camp, where you use points you won from battle to buy upgrades for each character. They all have two unlockable outfits and several different abilities. SpongeBob can become Doodle Bob or SpongeGar, Patrick can become a band geek or a hippie version of himself, Sandy can go into either hibernation or cowgirl mode, and Squidward can become either an artiste or handsome Squidward. The team that carried me for most of the game was SpongeGar, Band Geek Patrick, Hibernation Sandy, and Handsome Squidward. This gave me a good balance for each weakness. The fights are easy in the beginning, so you can quickly stock up on points, so don't worry too much about making the wrong purchases. You move through six different zones on a map and fight through whichever monsters come your way. It's a nice callback to see they're the same ones from the last two games. But they aren't only capable of causing damage to your patty supply. They can also charge attacks and use abilities such as one that nullifies a certain type against them even their designated weakness. Once you use a special attack, you have to wait a few turns to use it again, but you can use a less effective one more freely. However, I found that even if it's a designated weakness, it usually isn't as strong as a special attack the monster isn't weak to. It depends on the enemy, though. You can experiment because most of the monsters aren't that tough. It's easy to farm your way through this. It's also easy to buy every upgrade before you even reach the final stretch. Apart from your two attacks, every character also has a special ability. SpongeBob can cook patties to recover health, for instance. The only one that really came in handy for me was Sandy's ability to assign a second weakness to an enemy. That can be extremely useful. At the end of every map, you meet a boss. They're all monsters you could formerly tame in the last few games. So nice to see they all have names this time. If you set your team right, the bosses should be easy enough to plow through. At the very end, we find out who the customer who ordered the patties is. It's none other than Long Tan and Handsome himself. Ain't that the biggest plot twist you've ever seen? So yeah, this game is great. I think of the three, this is the one I'd probably go back to play the most. It's addicting, and it can be cool to see all the different moves in action. You do have to do a bit of battle planning, but it isn't too hard. Anyone could play it and easily get the hang of it. This makes for a satisfying conclusion to a really good series. All three Monster Islands have value to them, and it's no surprise that the series became so popular. There's a lot of variety, and all of them are worth playing today. Just another great series to come out from the games on Nick.com. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.